We're going to pick up our study now. In, Col in uh, Genesis, Galatians, sorry, chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to finish off the book tonight. Um, if you're ready, we'll start in verse 1. Starts off with brethren. Hey, Adam, God bless you, brother. Starts off with brethren. If any, uh, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Hey, Christina, God bless you. Adam, you're early. God bless you, brother Andrew. God bless you, Julie, Tracy, Gail. Hello, God bless you. We're in verse 1. The apostle starts off saying, Brethren, if any of you, if any man be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you also be tempted. Hey, Luann, God bless you. This is a, a very important verse. Halden, God bless you, my brother, from Saskatoon. We're going to wait a few minutes. I want everybody to get this verse. This is a, a crucial uh, beginning here. It, it, it touches a lot. I think about this verse quite often. At least I have over the years um, as I've had to deal with issues with people. Um, first of all, let's just say this. There's Notice it says, you which are spiritual. You which are spiritual. The Bible does, uh, the New Testament does distinguish between spiritual and carnal Christians. Spiritual and carnal, weak and strong is another way to put it. Uh, in one place he said, you that are strong. Hey Josh, God bless you from Iowa. You that are strong, it says, bear the burdens of the weak. Now, so there, there's an indication there that there are going to be weak believers in the church. And we who are strong are to bear the burdens of the weak. And, and here, this, this verse is comparable where he says, you that are spiritual. In other words, you that are strong, you that are tracking with God, doing good. I think it's important that we never get a big head, never feel puffed up. Never feel better than anybody. Never never look down on believers. If there's something that will wreck your spiritual life faster than anything, it's, it's pride. It's spiritual pride. Spiritual pride is worse than any kind of pride. It's even worse than the, the arrogancy of a non-believer. Spiritual pride is probably the worst sin for spiritual progression in God. I mean, if you think about the devil, the devil's sin was spiritual pride. If you've never read uh, the Old Testament about the devil in Isaiah... In Ezekiel, it said that he was the sum of all beauty and perfection. But then it says he got puffed up. He got he got built up in his head, and he actually thought he was better than God. God created him perfect and beautiful and powerful and full of wisdom, and he got puffed up. So it's something that we need to keep into our consideration, no matter how spiritual or strong or better we are or we think we are than other people, that we never get puffed up um, because it limits you. You can't do anything in God. Now, you that are spiritual are commanded to restore those who are overtaken in a fault, a fault meaning a sin. And it's not probably just talking about somebody makes one mistake, but somebody gets overtaken is the key word there. Overtaken means they've lost their, their they, they no longer have power over sin. They didn't just make a mistake. They're actually re-captured re, uh, and they're re-ensnared in their sin. Uh, a verse that could go with this very easily is the last two verses of James. Uh, the last two verses of James talk about dealing with a brother who gets entangled back in sin and how we're to go to that brother and win him back to the Lord. And that by winning him back to the Lord, it says we cover a multitude of sin and save his soul from death. Literally, if somebody goes back to their sins and trespasses and lives a lifestyle of sin, they are dead as far as the, the Lord is concerned. And, and the, the prodigal son is a good example. In Luke 13, it says that the son went out of the father's house, took his inheritance, and went and lived with the harlots, the pigs. And when he when he came back to the house, the father said, we should rejoice because your brother who was dead is alive again. The word again is in there. So he was dead and now he's alive again because he came to his senses, he humbled himself, he repented and came back to the father. Now, knowing that if somebody goes out into spiritual darkness, spiritual death, willful lifestyle of sin, they're in death. I mean, we who are spiritual, we that are strong, hey, Mother-in-law Joni, God bless you. We who are strong, we that are spiritual, should consider those that are fallen. Consider those that are struggling. Consider those that have been overtaken and fall. And, and care for their soul enough to go to them. And that's, that's the key is, 
Uh, I know when we start talking this way, there's a there's a line that you have to really distinguish because the Bible's also clear about judging other people. Um, and I wish I had a whole sermon tonight. I would teach just on judging what what what's the line between uh, helping a brother, holding somebody accountable, bringing somebody's sin before their mind, and then judging or criticizing. Well, for me, it's no problem. I can take all the scriptures and it's very clear. You have in like 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, it says that we're to put a wicked person out of the church, the one that had committed fornication in the church. He clearly said, put that wicked person out of the church. In 2 Corinthians, he said, bring the, bring the brother back in. So he says to the church in Corinth, he says, don't you guys judge each other? Don't you guys, uh, don't you guys hold a standard? Isn't there any kind of a standard in your church? You just let it, it's a free for all? Because in the, in the, in the name of not judging, these days, and as well as in Paul's days, the church got into a free-for-all. Everybody didn't want to judge or criticize anybody, so they just kind of turned a blind eye to sin. Well, there's a fine line where we turn a blind eye to sin, and we uh, just let things go chaos, and then holding each other accountable in a godly manner. Uh, and the Bible is clear about us. If, if our brother sins against us, we're to go to him, Jesus said, one-on-one, -on -one, and conf tell the brother his sin. Uh, if he doesn't hear, you're to go and get another brother and go and tell him together. And if he doesn't hear, you're supposed to bring him before the church. And if he doesn't hear, you're supposed to put him out of the church. I mean, if we started practicing what the Bible says about how to deal with sin with each other, I mean, our churches would be completely radically transformed. I mean, it would be an amazing... We'd have revival probably just on that one issue if we'd start holding the line and holding each other accountable. Now, for me, the line is very clear. Humility has got to be the underpinning attitude in which we, we we go to a brother or a sister and hold them to the line. Now, if in our heart we have any anger, animosity, tension, self-righteousness, bitterness, hey Marty, God bless you, Art, then we better not even go. You're better off leaving it alone because you can open yourself up. I want you to listen real close at the end of verse 1. This is Galatians 6, 1. He said, consider yourself. Go with the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, temptation comes from Satan. We, we know that because the Bible says in James that God does not tempt any man to sin. So where does temptation come from? It comes from Satan. Uh, Jesus told Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. Satan has desired to have you. I mean, Jesus knew that Satan was requesting permission to sift Peter. Jesus knew that when he was still a man. He knew the, the workings of Satan, that it was Satan's desire to tempt and take over people. He did it. He did it with Judas Iscariot and was able to take him over. There's something. The demonic activity of Satan is in tempting. One of the names of the devil in the Bible is the tempter. The tempter. He's a tempter. So, when you go with a critical spirit, when you go with a self righteous spirit, when you go in pride and you look down on somebody and criticize or hurt them, you actually can open yourself up to the demonic influence of Satan. So he's say, saying, you that are spiritual, when you see you're somebody overtaken in a fall, go and deal with it. Don't turn a blind eye and act like it's not happening, but consider yourself. Know that you only stand by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're nothing without God. If, if God took his spirit from any one of us, we would be as weak and, and vulnerable as anybody on earth would be. To keep that in front of our minds, that we don't get puffed up thinking we're more than we are. When we go, but we have to go. Uh, and I know for some people that's a hard thing, but if you're truly spiritual, you consider yourself to be a spiritual person, you have an obligation. If you see a weaker, unspiritual, or a hurting brother, or somebody that has been overtaken in sin, you have a responsibility to go and tell them their sin in a humble, spiritual, helpful, you're doing it not to hurt them, but you're doing it to build them up. James 5.19, it says, Let him know that he that converts the sinner, and that's a brother who errs in context, if you read the last two verses of James, let him know that he that turns his brother back to the truth saved his soul from death and covered a multitude of sins. The power of that, and I've had to do this on many occasions. The Lord has put me in a position where I knew, knew somebody was in a sin, and I had to go and tell it to him and look. And it's not an easy thing, but you're helping them. You're, it's not hurting them. Now, the, the other side of that is when you see somebody in fault, and this probably happens more often, you go and tell somebody else. You go and, you go and, you go and gossip, or you go and, I can't believe so-and-so is doing this, or so-and-so. I mean, that is, that, is the, uh, that is the epitome of unspiritual. That's what carnal is. Carnal is to see, see something wrong and gossip about it, talk about it, and not actually do something to help. 
That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, you bind men with burdens that are hard to bear, but you don't help them lift their burden with one finger. So you have no no desire to actually help people. You just want to pile more. You know, people are bound up enough. People are struggling enough. People are hurting enough. The, the spiritual people need to act spiritual and help lift burdens. Jesus lift, lifts burdens off people. That's what he does. That's his ministry. Come to me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. We need to aid Jesus, if we're truly spiritual, in lifting people's burdens and helping them get their lives right. And the only way to do that is to be bold, be loving, be humble, but go and deal with them. Help them. People just need help. So anyway, bear ye, here verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's a huge statement. By bearing people's burdens, you're actually fulfilling the law of Christ. What is Christ? What is his activity? It's in the bearing of burdens. He wanted to bear the sins of the world for our benefit. That's how into burden bearing he really is, to lift the burden. He loves to help the poor, love the, to help the weak, the, the needy, the, the downtrodden, the orphan, the widow, the whoever, the, the weak in general. Jesus is, is the helper of those who are weak. And so the Holy Spirit's name is comforter helper who needs comfort and help it's those that are weak it's though we all need the holy spirit don't get me wrong but more so the ones that are weak struggling so if we're going to be in the spirit of jesus christ fulfilling the law of jesus christ we've got to bear one another's burdens uh so that's that verse three he says for if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing he just deceives himself and i'll tell you what the the worst kind of deception is self-deception you know, if somebody else deceives you, somebody else can undeceive you. But if you deceive yourself, if you're self-deceived, you think you're more than you are, you, you gauge yourself differently than reality, yeah, you, there's really no help in you because you've tricked yourself. And, and this is the lukewarm church that Jesus talks about in Revelation 3. He said, you say you're rich and increased with goods, but I say you're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. So they weren't even able to discern their own spiritual condition. The way they saw themselves was rich. The way Jesus saw them was poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. So they were unable to discern. They had a higher value of themselves spiritually than they should have. It's, it's just a, this, this is just a warning that we need to think of ourselves more soberly. Because God dealt us the measure of faith. None of, us, none of us did this on our own. None of us got where we are on our own. If, if we're anything in God, it's by His grace. And we need to keep that in the front of our minds. So he takes it a step further and says, But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. We don't need to pat ourselves on the back or promote ourselves or brag about ourselves. We just need to know in ourselves that we're doing God's will and we're, we're who we, we, we should be. We're just basically doing what we, sit, we should be doing anyway. You know, the parable Jesus said, when you've done everything that you were commanded to do, say of yourselves, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done what my master asked me to do. Jesus said, when you've done everything you're supposed to do, just say of yourself, I am just an unprofitable servant who's only done what my master asked me to do. So when we're fulfilling all the, 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 the rules, so to speak, and the regulations and the commandments of Jesus Christ, there's no reason to get puffed up. We're only doing what was asked of us. It's just the, the bare minimum requirement. Again, in uh, Romans 12, two, uh, 1, he said, beseech, I beseech you, therefore, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable for you to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy unto God. That's just your reasonable service. It's not above and beyond to live a holy life. So once we think that way, we, we don't allow pride and self-righteousness and criticism and judging other people. We don't allow that. If I'm going to judge somebody's sin, if I'm going to look at their sin and recognize it and highlight it, then I better be ready to go and sit down with them to help them. Otherwise, just just turn, don't look at their sin. Don't You, you just open yourself up. Okay, verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Now, uh, I don't know how to even crack this without seeming like I'm hawking for an offering here. Uh, but, you know, and, and for those of you maybe that don't know me, somebody might watch this video and think, oh, here's another money preacher. And let me tell you, I pastored a church for eight and a half years. I didn't take a salary those eight for eight years of that eight and a half or seven and a half of the eight and a half. I didn't even take a salary at all. I didn't get paid. I did voluntarily. I've never in my life preached one sermon on giving. I've never preached one sermon on tithes and offering. Not to this day. And I don't have any intention on doing it now. But uh, I do, I have thought a lot about it since I stopped pastoring. I went into itinerant ministry and 
I've had some time to think about church and how things went and giving, receiving, and all the uh, doctrines. And, and it's obvious today that there's there's been so much teaching, uh, exaggerated teaching on tithing and offering and giving and sowing your seed. And you turn on a Christian network and I mean, they're they're begging for money nonstop. And it's like the people say in the world, the church is all about money. And, and I saw all these abuses and exaggerations and I stayed clear from it. I never, we didn't pass an offering around in the church, a bag. We had a box on the wall. If people wanted to give, they could give into the box. We were very careful never to make this thing about money because we didn't we didn't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. But you know, I've had some time to reflect, and I've I've really come to the conclusion that the the lack of good teaching on giving and and sowing and reaping, or however you want to describe it, the the lack of good teaching is really robbing the church because with all I've recognized, with all exaggerated teachings, bad teachings. The overreaction to those teachings sometimes is worse than the bad teachings themselves, whether it be the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You got people say that's not for today and because you got people that are acting weird. So the over uh, exaggerated uh, response is just to say that's all demonic. It's not for today. So they throw the bath, the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because some people quack like dogs and chickens and run around in red socks and on chairs and do all kinds of crazy events. So then anything that looks supernatural, people just push it out of the church. Well, the overreaction to the people that are acting foolish is more harmful than the people that are acting foolish. Same with the, the offering and giving and tithing message. The overreaction to that message is that people don't give at all. I mean, I, I can just tell you because I was in ministry as a pastor, and so you know what comes in, and you know how many people are there, and it's just evident that the same basic five people, and I was among the biggest givers in the church, the same five of us funded the entire ministry. And so the rest of the people uh, that came in and out, and we're talking dozens and dozens and dozens of people, just weren't giving, and, and you know, it's a, it's, it's a crime. And, the, and I can see why pastors make it all about money because it's hard to operate without money. I mean, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line to tread. But, you know, it really cheats. People are cheating themselves out of a major blessing by not giving because, well, look what the Word of God says. And, and Lord, we're going to take verse 6, 7, and 8 together because it's in context. First, he says, let him that is taught, so whoever's teaching you, you're, you're to pay them, communicate unto them. That means to help them financially. In all good things, you're to give back. Now, why do you give, first of all? It's not necessarily to aid the person only. It, it, it is. Uh, the Bible says he that preaches the gospel should live from the gospel. So if you're preaching the gospel, you should make a salary enough to, to pay your way. Because the gospel, the Bible says the workman is worthy of his wages. And it also says don't muzzle the ox while he treads. So it's biblical for a preacher to be paid and to receive financial service from his work in the ministry. However, uh, the next verse says, Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So the idea of sowing and reaping connected to money is a biblical concept. When you give out of, the, out of your heart, because not only are you trying to support that person that's preaching, but you're not actually even, the secret is, and I learned this a long time ago, you're not giving to the person. If you're giving money to the per, if you're giving money to Aaron, saying you you might as well keep your money. It's it's not worth worth your effort. But if you're giving the money to Jesus Christ in Aaron, saying because you believe he's doing the work of Jesus Christ, and you're actually giving it to Jesus for his work, then you can expect you're sowing into the Spirit's work. Now, if the person is doing the Spirit's work, he's he's actually carrying forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, then by you giving money, you're actually giving it to Jesus. So it's you're providing. Uh, uh, the means by which the gospel of Christ goes forth. When you see it that way, giving takes on a whole new meaning. It's more, it's a blessing to give because you're giving to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is the one who said, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shake, uh, shaking together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Men will give back to you when you give to me. And it was Jesus who said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where the moth can't eat it, the rust can't get to it, and the thief can't break in and steal. And by, by putting money into the, the kingdom, you're putting it up into heaven where, where it's, it's got an eternal reward. So the problem is when, when pastors are pressuring people to give money, and if you don't tithe, I've heard it several times, the, the pastor saying, if you don't tithe, you're, gonna, you're cursed with a curse. They use the verse out of Malachi. 
Now, I don't know why they don't teach the rest of the Old Testament that, you know, and, and try to push it on New Testament believers and threaten them with hell. But particularly the giving, the tithing, they use it in a way as if it's a commandment in the New Testament. Now, I, I don't want to get into this too much tonight. I've already probably spent more time on this than I want. I didn't even want to crack this at all. But while we're on it, uh, I, I'm out to lunch on whether or not tithing is a New Testament concept. But one thing we have to admit is that there is not one New Testament verse that commands the Christian to tithe. So any pastor that takes the Old Testament verse about tithing and puts it in such a way that it's like a, a, a threat or intimidation to pressure people into giving their 10% or else is, I think, such a horrible, I think that is a terrible way to to do anything in the New Testament because the New Testament is not that attitude. The Old Testament was that way. Do this or perish and, and die. In the New Testament, though, it, God doesn't force or impose rules on people. Uh, there are some commandments, of course, but uh, the, a lot of the old, the old way in the Old Testament isn't the new way in the New Testament. The Bible says, specifically, Paul said, as every man purposes in his heart, so let him give, for God loves a cheerful giver. So God isn't trying to force you into giving your money, and I don't know why men of God take it upon themselves to try to pressure or dominate or threaten people into giving money, because that's not, there's no blessing in that anyway. Even if you give out of a pressure or intimidation or a threat, you aren't going to receive a reward because you're not giving the money with a cheerful heart. You're not giving it in faith. You're not giving it to produce a fruit in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So really, your giving is in vain. Another error that I see in the giving uh, is that they promise you that if you give, you're going to get blessed. And if you give you know, your tithe, you'll be blessed. And they also always go back to the Old Testament and show how you'll be blessed with the tithe. The problem with that is they never mention holiness or obedience or purity or faith or genuineness or sincerity. You know what? You can give 10% of your money all you want. And if you're at home living carnal and disobedient and lukewarm and rebel, how can I promise you that if you give, you're going to be blessed? It takes a lot more to be blessable by God than just giving your money. You can give your money and still not be in a, a blessable condition. This is just one aspect of being blessable is giving. But giving isn't the only aspect. And so when I hear pastors preaching the offering and telling them, if you put the money in, you'll receive this much back and you'll receive this blessing and that blessing. It's as if this category of tithing and money has taken on its own life. And you can just kind of use the Old Testament interchangeably with the New Covenant and just twist it all up and make people give. I'm opposed to that. I think it's done more damage to the body of Christ than we can ever calculate and to the world because we've, we've just looking like money-hungry pirates. But on the, on the same hand, we can't just throw out the idea of giving. Don't overreact uh, to you know, bad uh, means by withholding your money from the... Because you're withholding, you're withholding a blessing from your life. The Bible says, give and it shall be given. So we can receive blessing, not only money blessing back now, but I, I'll just tell you a quick story. The, the, the time I've probably felt the presence of God in my life more than any other time, I had one encounter with God specifically where his presence actually knocked me to the ground. And I cried like a baby literally for 30 minutes. If you know me, I don't cry. I don't cry easy. I don't get emotional. The power of God actually just fell on me. And I cried for 30 minutes and I shook like a leaf. And my wife was with me and she was shaking and crying too. God just just poured out his spirit upon us and all in one in one service. Well, it just so happened that at that service, I had gone to the bank and gotten a money order and I had got the money order to this ministry and it was the biggest offering I'd ever given. And I had a revelation that I was giving this money not to the person preaching, but to their ministry, which was worldwide helping the masses find Jesus. And I gave it out of a, of a pure heart to Jesus. This is for you. And God met me in that exact, while I was given the offering, I was still standing and the power of God came all over me. And it was the biggest event I've ever had in my spiritual life. The, the, the most powerful experience I've ever had in God. And I would say it was, it was connected to the sacrificial offering. So I, I'm only saying this not to get kudos. I'm saying this because if you're not giving into the ministry of Jesus Christ, you're just cheating yourself out of a major blessing. And it is important to God that we give. 
there's probably nothing more important than our money to us in life. I mean, our family, obviously, kids, children, wives, whatever. But I mean, material things, there's nothing more important to us than our money. So where we place our money, it means something to God because it shows where the man, whatever a man's uh, treasure is, it says there's there where his heart be also. So wherever you put your money, that's where your actual heart or, or service or love or passion is. So when you give, you're showing God. You're not giving to the person or the ministry just to help them get some uh, something to eat or clothing. You're actually putting it into the hands of Jesus and saying, use this for the ministry. It's not for him, it's for you. And then you have to obviously trust that that person that you're giving the money to is doing the work of the ministry and that they're going to be faithful. But whether they are or aren't, it isn't, it isn't going to uh, help or hurt your, your benefit because you did it out of faith. You did it out of a sincere heart. So God's going to bless you. So he ties the idea of sowing and reaping. He says, if you sow to the, to the flesh, verse uh, 8, he said, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. So if you're a giver, you're going to receive. And that's not just money, it's all things. It's, if you live a, a holy life, if you sacrifice for God, if you live a life of prayer, if you read and study the Bible, these are all sowing. You're sowing into your spiritual life. You're sowing into God. You're sowing into the Spirit. Well, he said, he that sows to the flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. And unfortunately, uh, most Christians spend most of their money on the flesh. They spend most of their money on themselves. They live most of their life under themselves. And it's sad. I feel sorry for them. They're not cheating the church. They're not cheating the God. They're cheating themselves because they could be doing so much more with their money, with their time, with their energy to, to, to promote the kingdom of God and the gospel of God. And I'm sure when we get into heaven, I think the one regret before maybe all the sorrows taken away from us, the one regret we're all going to have is that we didn't do more to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ with the energy, the time, and the money that we had on earth because we will see how huge the, the, the reality of eternity and eternal life or eternal damnation is and we'll wish that we had done more while we were on earth to save sinners from their sin and to promote the kingdom of God. So if you sow to your flesh, he said you're going to of your flesh reap corruption and that word translated as destruction. Make no mistake about it. If you choose to live your life sowing to your flesh, for carnal things, worldly things, it, you're going to reap destruction from that. But he said, he that sows to the Spirit, and that word is capitalized, S-P-I-R-I-T, so it's talking specifically about the Holy Spirit. He that sows to the Holy Spirit will of the Holy Spirit reap life everlasting. So no matter if you're giving your, your good works, you're giving time, you're giving your money, Make sure that you're giving it to the Holy Spirit and your mind is that I'm not doing this for man. I'm not doing this for your for church. I'm not doing this for any, even if it is to help people, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for the Holy Spirit because Jesus commanded me to give. He commanded me to be faithful. He commanded me to help. He commanded me to do unto the least of these. So I'm doing it to the Holy Spirit. Now, when you do it with that attitude, you'll of the Spirit reap something in return. Now, we don't do it just to get back. And I think that's another error in this sowing and reaping gospel that's out there being preached is that if you give, then you'll get. Well, if you're giving to get, you're giving with the wrong attitude. We're giving because God is worthy of our very best. Remember, it was the first two brothers on earth, uh, uh, Cain and Abel. The, the, the thing that separated the one God was pleased with and the one God wasn't pleased was their offering. Uh, Cain uh, killed his brother because he was jealous because God received his brother's offering because it was given in the best. And he gave his very least and God wasn't pleased with his offering. And it led to murder. I mean, think about how important the idea of giving is pleasing to God. Now, verse... Nine, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Hey, Jamie, God bless you, I see you. Let us not be weary in well-doing. This is to say after we've done what we're supposed to do, let's not get tired. I, I mean, there is a, there's, a, there's a gap always. And I've even started to recognize something. I, I can see now sometimes I feel like I start receiving a, a blessing or a breakthrough spiritually and I start questioning, you know, all of a sudden I start to get more revelation or I feel a sense of closeness to God. And I can think back months before or a season before where I was really uh, pressing in, questioning, asking God for, for certain revelation on certain issues in the Bible or whatever. And I can actually trace back where I was really pressing into God. And then the benefit doesn't come sometimes for months, maybe even years. So once you've done the will of God, I think we expect like now I'm doing God's will any day now I should just get blessed. I think God has designed his working intentionally that there's a delay. 
in his blessing, in his in the breakthroughs that we have. So you might be questioning God about some specific thing and seeking in his face and praying and reading your Bible and wanting answers and feeling like I'm not getting the answers. And then three months later, four months later, without you're not even looking for it anymore, and the Lord brings the exact question that you had asked him right before you with the answer, with such force and clarity, and you're like, wow, it, there was a delay, but God showed up. I think sometimes, though, people start to be faithful, press into God, read the Bible, pray, and they don't see immediate results. Well, they give up. They get they get weary. They get tired. They say, um, there's nothing to this, or maybe God isn't interested in me, or... Listen, no no farmer puts his seed in the ground and goes out the next day looking for a harvest. Nobody plants seed and then expects the next day to have to have fruit. You put it in the ground and then you water it. You put it in the ground and you fertilize it and you take care of it and you prune it and it becomes something. It grows in. I mean, nothing in life comes cheap and easy. I don't know why we think our spiritual life is any different. The the whole idea of the spiritual life is is used in terms is described in terms of sowing, reaping, seeds, harvest, laboring, uh, cultivating. Paul even said some uh, someone plants and somebody waters, but it's God that provides the increase. So many uh, of the the parables in the in the in the New Testament deal with this this concept. When we plant the seed in the ground, when we put the 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 the, the word in. Sometimes it takes months or maybe even years for, for us to get the full harvest of what, what our work is. But let's not give up. After you've done the will of God, the Bible says you need patience. After you've done the will of God. Not before, but after you've done the will of God. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39 is very good scripture. You should really memorize that. Hebrews 10, 35 says, After you've done the will of God, you need patience. So that after you've done his will, you might receive the promise. But it doesn't come immediately. That's why you need patience. So you sow, you, you press in, you pray, you, you, you're faithful. Wait a few months. Don't give up. If you don't see immediate results, God will bless your work. God, will, you, will, you, will be, you will be breaking through. But it doesn't always come overnight. So as we have therefore opportunity, he said, let us do good unto all men, especially to those that are of the household of faith. As we have opportunity to help each other, bless each other, we should do it. And not just uh, Christians, even lost people, because that's a, a part of your testimony. But specifically, he said, even more, especially those that are saved, your brothers and sisters who are made in God's image and are reborn by Jesus Christ. We should go extra mile to help and bless, not just to do it for them, but again, to keep in our mind, we're doing it to Jesus. Remember in Matthew 25, Jesus said, when you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. When, and they, and they, they helped the prisoner, they fed the sick, they, helped the, uh, they fed the hungry, they clothed the sick and the homeless. And Jesus said, when you did that to them, you did that to me. And, and that needs to be our mentality when we're helping people, uh, that we're doing it to Jesus. We're doing it for him. And we will receive a blessing, um, but more so we'll be pleasing to God. And I think that's more important than any blessing is that we live a life pleasing to God. So he said, see how large a letter I've written to you with mine own hand. As many have, as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. He's reflecting back to those Jews who make a show in the flesh. They 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 like the the uppermost seats at the at the church service. They like to look spiritual with their flowing gowns. But he said they preach circumcision. They're going back to the circumcision because they don't want persecution, because the message of Christ when they when they stopped uh, being kosher with circumcision and they separated themselves from the law keepers. They they not only were being persecuted by the unbeliever, but they were in the in the Gentiles, but they were then being persecuted by the Jews. So it was easier for them to add circumcision back into the gospel because then they were more acceptable and more kosher to the to the Jews. Well, Paul said those those people are false. They're 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 just trying to appeal or appease or fit in or he said they they constrain you to be circumcised only so that they don't suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. All they're trying to do is avoid persecution. But listen what he said, they neither themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire you to be circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So they're not even doing the rest of the law. They're only keeping the one symbol of the law, but they're not actually even fulfilling the law, so they're glorying in the flesh. But God forbid Paul said that I should glory in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ 
by whom the world is crucified unto me and I am crucified to the world. One of the most powerful statements, obviously, in Galatians, that we are crucified to the world through the cross of Jesus Christ. We no longer identify with the world as everybody else does. We don't fit in. We don't get along. We don't go along. We're not just a face in the crowd. We are something separate, something other, something different, something unique. We are identified in burial and in resurrection with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our life. He's not just a, a weekend hobby. He is our actual Life. We have been crucified to everything except him. That's Christianity. Anything less than that is not. So look what he says. This is a great statement. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision means anything, neither uncircumcision. What is it? It's just a cutting of the flesh. It means nothing. But he said, a new creature. Wow, I love that. This is all that matters in Jesus Christ is that we are living the reality of the new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we all know that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away and all things, not some things, not a few things, all things have become new. This is all that means anything in Christianity is that you are living in the reality of the new creature. That all things in your life, you're not identifying with the old you at all. That old you is dead. You do not identify with the world on their terms. You are you are crucified with Christ. You are put to death. The old you is put to death. And the new you is renewed in the knowledge after Jesus Christ. You're living in the realities and the faith and the consciousness of the words and power and spirit of Jesus Christ. That's all that means anything. Not, not circumcision, law, Jew, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. It means nothing. You're either a new creation transformed by the power of Jesus Christ or it means nothing. Not at all. Let's not get caught up in, in titles and labels and categories. We are crucified in Christ. The only thing that matters now is the new creation, that I am living in newness of life, that I'm walking in newness of life. Hey, Preston, God bless you. And he said, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. I mean, that is a tremendous statement. What a blessing. He's praying a blessing for those that live in the reality of the new creation, the new creature, that you are passed away in Christ. The old you is dead and gone. Nobody will ever recognize him again because he's a done away, defeated man on the cross or woman on the cross. And the new you has been renewed in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And whoever he said walks according to that rule, Peace be on him in mercy and upon the Israel of God. I mean, what a statement. Then he goes on to say, Hey, Luann, James, God bless you guys. From henceforth, he said, Let no man trouble me. From here on out, let no man give me a hard time, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What a statement. He said, Look at the marks. I don't need anybody. I don't need to confirm myself. I don't need to argue anymore. Just come over here. I'll take off my shirt, let you see the marks, the stripes, the beatings, the whippings that I've taken for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will testify of my good works. They will testify of the life I have in God. What a, what a man. Been through everything you can imagine and back and stayed faithful all the way to the end. Brethren, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That concludes the book of Galatians. Uh, I thank you guys for, for tuning in tonight. I, I'm, I'm going to cut it short, but I, I want you to know I'm going to be getting live here in the next few days, and we're going to begin to talk about faith. I, I've been alluding to it throughout the book of Galatians. Uh, I'll just say this to set up maybe where we'll, we'll, we'll begin to start soon here, and, and that is the Bible has to change has to change forms for a lot of us because for some of us, we've seen this book as a book of rules as a book of ordinances, or as a book of commandments. And, and I'll be honest, for me, this is, this is how I've treated the word for most of my Christian life. Uh, I've treated it as a book of, uh, this is regulations on how a Christian is supposed to live. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm, I stand behind all my teachings. I, I believe them all to be biblical, spirit-led, true, and I'll stand behind them to the death. However, I want us to start looking at the Bible as a book of promises ready to be apprehended by faith. And, I, and I've been reading the Bible that way for the first time in my life. And I'm going to be honest with you. It has revolutionized my faith. My life in God has come to a uh, another level. I don't need to brag. I'm not trying to boast. I'm just happy in Jesus. My attitude has changed. My my overall look, I'm no longer, I don't feel cynical. I don't feel uh, uh, any any dismay or disappointment or discouragement. I, had, I realized that I had become discouraged and downtrodden because I saw so much trouble in the church and so much 
And I'm saying this, I wasn't out living, living in sin. I was in church, I'm preaching, I'm living faithful, but I'm just grieved because everybody around me seems to be, uh, there just seems to be destruction and chaos in the church and discouragement and confusion and dis de deception. And, I, and I, I think I got more focused on what was wrong and, and all the issues and problems and I begin to get disappointed and discouraged. And I even begin to question, is there a place in ministry? Do I even want to be in ministry? And I was asking these serious, honest questions. And I, man, God revolutionized my spiritual life. He began to teach me about faith. And faith has unlocked something for me. I, I begin to see the Word of God in different light. I'm not just reading through looking for the commandments to preach you know, on holiness or obedience. I'm going to still do that to the day I die. Don't get me wrong. But I'm seeing there are so many promises in this New Testament there are so many, thus saith the Lord, that this is what I want you to experience and have and be. And, and I think we don't focus near enough on the promises. The promises of God are yes and amen. And I don't want to preach too much to you tonight. I would if I, if I get started, I will. But I want you to know God said, I've exalted my word above my own name. I've exalted my word above my good name. Can you think about how valuable, how powerful the name of God is? There is nothing more powerful than the name of God, except the fact that God said, I've exalted my word above my own name. And he's done that for a reason, so that we can have a, a sure place to put our confidence and our faith. And if we don't read the Bible as a book of, of promises from a father to his children, waiting to be apprehended by faith in those who take the word as it is and obey it and practice it and, and walk by it, but we're cheating ourselves out of the promises and the blessing and the life that God has for those who love him, those that are faithful. So we're going to begin to dive into some of these promises. I want to, I want to begin to teach him because I don't think I've taught near enough on the promises of God. I've taught a lot on commandments and I will keep doing that. But I think we need to focus on the promises. I mean, healing for the believer is a promise from God. I've been just studying this subject of healing. I am blown away how many times and in, in how many ways God promises physical and emotional health for the believer if we, if, we, if we meet his conditions and if we act upon the word by faith. We're not to be in fear and depression and anxiety and discouragement and sickness and, and any of the other things because Jesus Christ promises freedom. Now, the, the thing about the promises of God is they're not just automatic. They have to be accepted, believed, and acted upon in faith. So I believe we need brainwashed we need our brains washed. Don't get, don't get weird. I'm not starting a cult. We need our brains washed from, from deception, from, I guess, just uh, mis misunderstanding of God's word, his goodness, his, his plan, his purpose. So I'm going to get into some things probably that are controversial, to, you know, probably going to make people raise their eyebrows at me. I don't care. I'm so sure of what I know. I, I know that God exalted his word above his name. His word is so absolutely true, so absolutely plain and clear and concise. If it's not, we have nowhere to put our trust, nowhere to put our confidence. But since God said, I've exalted my word above my name, he said, my word will not return to me void. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So we can put our faith in the word of God, the spoken, written word of God, that it is true, it is yes, it is amen, and take it to the bank. And if everybody thinks we're nuts, then everybody thinks we're nuts. But I know what, if I take this word as God's word and act upon it, I'll get the results. If I only read it as a history book or as a book of commandments, we're missing a great benefit that God has for those that love him. So uh, I look forward in the future. In the next few days, I'll probably start doing some of these teachings on faith and some of the, bringing out some of the promises of God that I think are going to really start to make us look at Christianity a little bit differently. I think uh, the earth is is desperate. You know what they're desperate for? Uh, doctrine, yeah. True, true preaching, yes. Yeah, all that. But you know what they really need to see? Somebody who's taking God at his word and receiving the benefits. You know the Bible says, whatever you ask uh, in my name, I'll do it for you. Did you know God said that? He'll do anything you ask him. Now, I, I know some of us have prayed and not got answers, but we just don't question why. Well, I think we should question why. If God promised us answers and we're not getting answers to prayer, we should question why. And I've been doing that. Honest questions. Why aren't we seeing this that's promised? Why are we, what are we going to just pass over it or say it's all done away with and make excuses? Or are we going to get honest with ourselves and say, I'm not experiencing what the Bible said. Why not? And when we begin to begin to question, God begins to give me answers and us answers. And I'm going to share those answers here in the near future. So God bless you. I love every one of you. I pray for you and I, I bless you. And I hope that, uh, 
your your new year started off well and, and that you're walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. And if I can do anything to help you, just send me an email. God bless you. Love y'all.